Welcome to Human Potential at Work, the show where we explore social impact, inclusion, and empowerment of everyone, including persons with disabilities. Get ready to be inspired, hear success stories, and learn tips and principles for bringing out the best in everyone. Okay. Good morning, everyone, uh, or good day. This is Deborah Rue, and this is uh, you're listening to Human Potential at Work. I am the CEO of Rue Global Communications, and we're strategists and market influencers for the community of people with disabilities in the aging market. Um, I, I also want to do a shout out for archive captioning. We have Dawn with us today, and she's going to do live captioning so we can assure this is accessible to everybody. And I um, want to give everybody a quick little update too on a couple of things uh, impacting uh, my life and many other lives. Uh, Hurricane Florence is still here with us in the East Coast. I know uh, North Carolina is still being heavily impacted. Uh, in my neighborhood, we got tornadoes and uh, one of my neighbors had seven trees fall on her house. So uh, uh, Josh is joining us here from DC, but we're still being impacted. But we're hoping the worst of it's over. And I also want to do a shout out um, for a friend of mine that passed away on Wednesday. His name is Peter Ha, very young, 53, and his beautiful daughter, Emily Ha, who has worked for the company but is now engaged to my son. Um, the whole family is very devastated. So prayers are welcome. Um, so thank you for joining us again today. And we um, have a friend of mine, Josh Christensen. We have, we are new friends, but I have known about Josh's work for years. And I really, really like what they're doing over at Pete Works. They're part of the Department of Labor. So they're part of the United States government's effort to make sure, it, you know, everything is accessible for all of us. So Josh, welcome to the program today. Thank you so much, Deborah. I appreciate being on. Yes, and Josh, what we'd like to do is we definitely want to dig into why the United States government wanted to create Pete Works, but also before we go there, um, do you mind just really telling us more about who you are and how you got involved in this industry? I know that you've been a leader in our industry for a while. I've had the pleasure on being on panels with you. He's a wonderful speaker, if anybody needs a good speaker. But t tell us how you um, came to be at Pete Works. Sure. Well, I have a um, long background in diversity and inclusion. And it was mostly in the education space. And within that, did a lot of um, kind of workforce development, job readiness mm -hmm. skills. Um, so I had several years of working with young people um, around career development and specifically trying to get folks kind of underrepresented and may not have had the exact right background and pedigree into top competitive jobs. Um, after that career, I went into consulting with uh, the federal government. So I worked at uh, Deloitte Consulting for um, a few years and worked with uh, federal agency leaders um, around uh, workforce development, around talent management, around how they could uh, get the most and the best um, out of their employees uh, with different agencies. And um, out of that, uh, stayed in consulting and kind of, uh, we, we fell into Pete um, about, I guess it's almost five years ago at this point, a little over four years. Um, it had been started, but that's when we became involved. Um, and so it was a great combination of a lot of my background um, and um, added to some things that I was interested in, specifically technology. So big learning curve on the technology. Uh, I had experience with diversity and inclusion, a little experience with people with disabilities. That's also been um, a great learning experience um, and had the workforce development, but learning about accessibility the last five years, uh, specifically around technology has been um, a joy. Um, I really, uh, enjoy the work and see the future as, as very bright. Yeah, it, you know what, it's interesting as you, you explain your, your very robust past, because what, what happens is when we, um, you know, and I'll look at it from the lens of a corporation that wants to hire a person with disability, or, or people with disabilities, really not just one person, but there's a lot of moving parts. Yeah. You have to understand the diversity and inclusion part. You have to understand how do I accommodate people. You have to understand that if your websites and your, your software and your apps are not accessible, it's going to impact your employees with disabilities and your customers with 
um, disabilities. There's so many moving parts to it. Yeah, and and that gets to why you said, you know, why the government funded PEAT. Um, right. Really, it, it's out of, as you mentioned, the Department of Labor, it's funded out of the Department, um, the Office of Disability Employment Policy, so ODEP. And the issue was, is they saw, um, you know, the, the people with disabilities are underemployed, but where they saw some success in hiring initiatives, they were then having some fallback on people being able to succeed and retain. And that came from the technology not being in place. So you might have the best candidate, the most talented, the most qualified, and then get them in the workplace. But if you haven't thought about, um, you know, buying and, and promoting and uh, using accessible workplace technology, which, you know, several years ago, a lot of people had not, then, then that person can't succeed in their job. And so that was the problem that ODEP saw. And they sought to say, hey, if, if, we're, if we're encouraging people to, to get the right talent, if we're encouraging people to include people with disabilities, um, but then they can't succeed once they're there, that's an issue we want to tackle. Uh, I think the original grant uh, before I started, it was called ATTACK. I forget what it stands for, like Accessible Technology A. <laughs> but they really were trying to attack the problem of uh, right. people getting into the workplace and then not doing well. And so they, they then, you know, it morphed into Pete as a grant. And our job is really to work with the different stakeholders to promote the use and adoption of accessible workplace technology. So we work with employers, we work with the technology developers, we work with advocacy organizations to try to find the sweet spot um, that's gonna get some movement around really the, the, the use um, of accessible workplace technology. Um, so that takes us to many different roads, different partnerships, different resources we put out that are free and open to the public. But that's why, um, the Department of Labor set up Pete, and um, that's the space we've been working in the last six years now. And, and I, I want to make a few comments to that, because one thing that um, I'm very grateful for ODEP, the Office of Disability Employment Policy, they have shown leadership for many, many years and really been very supportive of all the different pieces of the community. Um, we've had um, a past episode, we talked to another program that um, ODEP uh, shortening Office of Disability Employment Policy supports, which is Ask Jan, and Jan oh, yeah. is Job Accommodation Network, and mm -hmm. we had a very dear friend of mine, Lou, on talking about Ask Jan, and it's an amazing program that's yeah. available in the United States to anybody that is struggling with accommodation. It's confidential, it's just, and, and they've been very supportive internationally as well, and Pete is another example of a program that uh, the United States government is putting out and funding to make sure that people with disabilities are, are really included. And I, I think as you were talking, I was thinking about a, a, an example that at the time really broke my heart. And there was, and this is years ago, maybe, you know, 10 years ago, um, there were three gentlemen that were hired in Colorado that were blind and used screen readers at a, at a corporation. And they did real well through the interview process. They hired them, the, the employer loved them but they realized pretty quickly that their screen readers did not work with the existing um, software that they needed to use to use their job, to do their jobs, and they were actually let go. Yeah. And when I heard that happen, I thought, there's so many reasons why that's a sad story, but I've also had, as an employer myself of individuals with disabilities, I have found it's I don't want to use the word easy. That's not the right word. I mean, you you want to accommodate all employees because we all have needs sometimes and you want to keep your best employees. But it is not just about hiring people with disabilities. It's about retaining, retention, yeah. retaining your employees. And if your technology is not accessible or your technology <clears throat> becomes inaccessible, and I'll um, give an example, but I won't name out and shout out the brand, but there was a, there's a very large um, American international brand, they're a multinational, that had, high, that had an employee that had been with them for many years that was blind. And he was <clears throat> very productive, amazing employee. And then they upgraded, they changed their, um, their systems. And when that happened, his screen reader no longer worked. And so for a while, 
they just tried to find him odd jobs to do because the employee wanted to stay. They wanted him to stay. But after a while, they realized this wasn't working. So they came to me and they said, Deborah, will you help us, <clears throat> excuse me, accommodate this employee and figure it out? We really, this is a win for both of us. And I said, well, I absolutely can help you, but I would recommend that you go to Ask Jan because they really are the experts. And honestly, not that I have a lot of expertise with this, but why should you pay me when you could go to right. this program that our government has very, created? Very honorable of you. Very honorable right. of you, Deborah. Well, and also, but it's the right thing to do. But I'll tell right. you this, and this is where, and I, I know you're going to want to address this comment. And so I really encouraged them. They said, no, 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 we don't want to go. And I've talked to Lou about this before, but no, we don't want to go to Ask Jan because they're funded by the government. And we're afraid that because they're funded by the government, um, we, we might get in trouble. And I said, okay. I said, I yeah. promise you, I promise they are not, this is not a trap. Our yeah. government isn't trying to figure out who's trying to fix problems. This is confidential. And I and I have spent so much time explaining that, but I want to give you the floor to explain that because I think some people have these fears. Yeah, well, there's several things that came to mind. One, you know, askjan.org, the job accommodation center, is an incredible resource. Um, and it's a technical assistance center um, in the true sense of the word that they are there to assist people that have issues. They have an incredible new resource that's uh, available on a mobile app that will walk you through from the beginning, you know, through employment on what you need, the issues you may encounter in dealing with accommodations. They'll jump on the phone with you. They will really walk you through uh, hand in hand to make sure that whether you're an individual or the employer, you can work together and work it out. Um, they dispel a lot of myths around expenses. They're incredible. And I would encourage all your viewers um, to check them out. Um, one thing I, I want to talk about before I go into the resources of Pete is to make sure that um, we're all on the same page when I talk, when I say accessibility, or I might say inclusive design or universal design, because you started talking about screen readers and there's some nuance. So to be clear, Pete has a laser focus around accessible technology. Uh, we want it created uh, accessible so that it is developed and designed accessible. A big part of that is working with screen readers or other types of assistive technology. Um, but uh, ideally, what we push and promote is that software would be developed and designed, uh, websites would be developed and designed in a way that you know um, most assistive technology wouldn't even be needed because uh, the screen reader would be built in. And you're seeing that now with Microsoft, with Google and different platforms now, uh, many of them can read the text to you. Um, and so, you know, we're still working on that with websites and the back ends, but that's the idea is to make sure that you're designing products that are inclusive of the most people and most abilities possible. Um, and then you would have less and less need for specific accommodations, less need for assistive technologies. We'll always need that stuff. And it's, it's imperative that we have it, but yes. focus is really making sure trying to push, um, uh, what's very feasible in the development and design of accessible technology. Um, so I wanted to put that out there and just kind of what we're talking on and focusing on. The second thing I would add around that is it's a huge plus um, for anyone. I mean, you could think of anyone, uh, you know, I use my, uh, Doug earlier today when he was texting you to see if you get on, used his voice to text, right? Well, that's a technology that's designed uh, to be inclusive. That's a technology that was designed for people with disabilities that may not have use of their motor uh, skills. Um, and lots of things are like that where people benefit from inclusive design. Uh, people will use it uh, whether they quote unquote need it or not because they see it as most efficient or the easiest way or what is most comfortable. And so we wanna make that accessible uh, to everyone. Um, and so it really is a business, it's a business case uh, for cutting edge technology and to get the most uh, production out of your workers. Um, then I wanted to tell a good story about, <laughs> yeah. about, about, um, about hiring and accessibility. It's one we've had a blog on, uh, but we've worked a lot with Sassy um, Outwater, who is um, part of what we call our think tank, kind of a group of people that advise Pete 
Um, and she told a story where she was applying for the job, a job that's kind of after the crash of 2008. You know, she was out of grad school, I think, and employment was tough. So she's out there working. She's going through um, online, filling out her application. And Sassy is blind uh, as one of her disabilities. And she's going through and filling it out. And she gets kind of to the end. And there's a, a radio button, a, a button, you know, an icon on the website. And it's not labeled. And she doesn't know if it's submit. She doesn't know if it's erase. She doesn't know what it is. Um, and, you know, she needs to uh, uh, fill it out. So she actually asked someone else um, that has their vision, not because she needed their smarts, their brain. She just needed their vision because it wasn't, because ideally, if it was accessible, that website would be coded. And on the back end, that label, that, that radio button would be labeled and the screen reader would read it. Right. But because it wasn't, she was stuck. So she used uh, this person, uh, the great part of the blog, it's very good. She's a great writer. She got a date out of it. That one. Oh, yay. But the better, <laughs> part of the, story is, the better part of the story is she was offered the job because she was the best candidate, the most good. qualified. Good. And um, the even better, better part of the story is, you know, that company could have missed out because they didn't have design. And before Sassy took the job, she said, you know, I can't in good faith take this unless you make your application process and your job board accessible uh, for all people. And they did that. So they hired her. They got the best talent. She's an amazing talent. Um, and then they made a commitment so that they wouldn't miss other great talent in the future in making their job boards and their career site um, accessible to all people. And that is an incredible story. And I think they got this talented woman that is smart enough to know how to use all of her resources. If yeah. you haven't made something accessible and I have to pull in somebody else to help me, yeah. it's unfortunate. I remember when I turned, it seemed like the day I turned 40, uh, my vision got worse and the phone I had at the time, I couldn't see it. I couldn't yeah. see when somebody would call me. So luckily I had a 16 year old son at the time. He's 31 now, or he's 30 now. Sure and I guess say Kevin, who's calling me, but it was sort of inconvenient for him to stay with me all the time to tell me who was calling. You know? So the next time I, when I bought my next phone, I bought a phone that I could see by myself, regardless of not being able to see as well. Yeah. And so you talked about this a little bit, but I was wondering if you just might explore a little, the situational disabilities, you know, yeah. that this is the thing that I love about accessibility and that a lot of the work you're doing is that when we make something accessible, we improve the experience for all users, for you sure. know? For so. Sure. Yeah, I mean, um, you mentioned people with disabilities and the aging population, right? Mm -hmm. um, right. Well, we, we all get old and that comes with a certain set of, of circumstances and, uh, you know, technology is gonna be there and be around. And it'd be great if, say you could choose the font size, which is very right. normal now. Um, and they have Zoom text. And that again is was a technology designed for to be as broad as use as possible. That is accessible. Um, but say, you know, like you said, situational, some people may be out, um, maybe they injured their eye or maybe they hurt their arm and you know they can't use certain things. Well, technology, if it's designed accessibly, can be used in a lot of ways. And so you might be able, you can navigate uh, your workstation, your computer, your software uh, using a keyboard instead of a mouse. Um, you know, you can use vocal commands as we mentioned before um, or have it read to you if your eyes, you know, maybe had a concussion or whatever the reason is that may be situational right. or temporary. Um, <clears throat> you know, I forget then is it one in four, one in five Americans has a disability. It's the largest one in four one now. One, one in four, four according to the CDC. If you add in situational, right? It's one in four Americans <laughs> have a disability. If you add in situational, you know, there's a good chance that at some point, if you aren't now dealing with disability, whether it's your reading uh, eyesight going on or whatever it is, you're going to. And so, um, whether you're an individual and you want to participate and succeed, accessible technology makes sense. Uh, and definitely, if you're an employer. Uh, and you want to have the people engaged, employees engaged, and have the widest set possible. This is a very tight talent market. Um, you want to be able to compete and have the best people. You need accessible technology. If you're a government and you want your citizens engaged and participating, all of that is moving online. And so making and designing um, software, programs, websites, portals, 
so that the most people can use them possible is just just makes good sense. Right. Uh, so you know now we're in the process of okay, now we know that how do we get people together to kind of to move the needle um, to have impact and create awareness around what is a really a feasible um, and doable and should be done uh, task. I agree. And I think there's there, you know, sometimes you're uh, this has happened to me many, many times. I'm in it. My hearing is pretty good. My eyes these days are giving me a hard time, but um, my eye doctor and I are talking about that. But um, I, I am in a situation where I can't hear. I can't hear. There's uh, there's construction on the street and all of a sudden I become severely hard of hear. Yeah. And so there's there's so many. And I love how. Um, we create this new technology like voiceover for the iPhone yeah. and everybody's using it. So yeah. it, to me, accessibility is a win-win. Closed captioning, right? You've got live closed captioning. I mean, uh, I need it. In my family, we started using it really as awareness around disability uh, for my kids, but now they like it. They want yeah. it because they're it, able to read and follow along. And if it helps me not, absorb the data. It helps my brain I actually find that it enhances my learning experience. Other yeah. people's brains work differently and, you know, but yeah, so accessibility is win. So let's- you, you've, you've heard, I'll give one, one more analogy general and then we can talk about some of Pete's specifics, but you've heard okay. the, the curb cut analogy is what we yes. all talk about with accessible technology. You know, the curb cuts were made for people with wheelchairs, right? right. That was an ADA issue. So people with wheelchairs could get up and down the street and go about their lives and their work. But who, everyone loves the curb cut, right? It's good yes. for strollers, it's good for bikes, delivery people. Uh, if you're carrying your luggage down the street, right? It's a technology that really benefits lots. And the same benefit and output you see when you apply it to technology. And so that's really right. what, we're, what we're trying to push. I agree. And so, yeah, so... First of all, I wanted to show the audience how brilliant Josh is. So you see what I'm talking about there. But then, but the thing that I like about Pete works is the some of the same reasons that I love, love Ask Jan. Um, this organization has been created by our government to support us all. They are not here competing with uh, vendors that are providing accessibility. Like, you know, I mentioned archive captioning. The archive captioning is a business. This is what sure. they do for a living. They employ people. This is wonderful. But I, you know, the thing that's exciting is that they're there to support all of us. And so I know that y'all have done a lot of things. You have, um, you work with a lot of di different partners. You have webinars. I've been blessed to do one of your webinars, but let's dig into how you, not only the services that you're providing, because there's a lot, and once again, they're all free. Mm -hmm. but also how you are partnering with the different communities in our space, the sure. corporations, the nonprofits, the disability organizations, the accessibility industry. Okay. Once again, there's so many moving parts here. Yeah, I'll, I'll give a, a few examples and then, you know, we can dig into the details as you see fit, but uh, <clears throat> they, yeah, they are, everything is free and open to the public. This is funded for our government and we uh, try to give the best unbiased resources and information we can. So I'd encourage people to check it out. But if we thought about some of our partnerships and how we develop resources and the different types of people we work with in the industry, uh, we really kind of have three uh, core stakeholders that I think of. We think of like employers and we think of technology developers and then we think of the disability community. Um, and so we touch base with them in different ways. I'll give some examples. Uh, if I start with the, the, the group around um, disability, we have number one, used that as a source of, of information and knowledge to drive some of the resources we did. So the first ever resource we ever put out is called TalentWorks. It's a comprehensive, um, lots of how-tos, best practices, um, very clear examples of what's wrong and how you can fix it on e-recruiting. And we got that because we were talking to um, advocacy groups and people in the space of of um, actually surveying people with disabilities around what their job application experience was. And I mentioned SASE's earlier. And we found that all too common, people could not complete um, online job applications. Right. Whether it's a platform like Indeed or Monster or all those, or it's an individual site, um, they just were not designed with accessibility in mind. And so, you know, from the survey, I think 
we had about 500 participants and these are all probably tech savvy people because they found their way to our website to take a survey online and almost half of them 46 percent said it was difficult to impossible to apply for the job so you know we immediately realized there was a problem we asked a that community about what to do. And that really was our first large resource that led to TalentWorks that talks about how to recruit online, whether it's social media, how to set up your job board, how to set up your web page, and the things, the most common errors and the easiest fixes to make your portal um, available. Uh, we also do some fun stuff. I'll kind of transition both with the community of people with disabilities and then also segue to the tech community and the tech developers and designers that are creating this. Um, we've hosted um, and convened some hackathons, um, mostly with the Web for All uh, group, which is international, and a lot of students in computer science, uh, many of them with disabilities. And we find an open source product and we find a company that's open to get, making it more accessible. And we, we work with them and do a hack during the conference to make it more accessible. And we've had some great uh, success. We've wild people in the, you know, we've got PhD students in there that are blind, that are coding and make stuff more accessible. Um, and people didn't think that was even possible. Um, and then we're improving the products themselves. So we've worked with a couple that have gone on to reach millions and millions of people that were inaccessible before and now are accessible. Um, so that's been a huge lift. Um, and if I stayed with working with the technology community, um, We've done a lot of touch points there. If I was going to highlight one, I think most recently we have partnered with um, the Teach Access Initiative, which is a consortium of a lot of um, technology groups and then universities. Their goal is to change the curriculums and make sure that accessibility is involved. And if you get a computer science engineering degree, you come out aware of accessibility. Um, and because we know that's important to employment, Pete has been supporting their efforts and working with them about how they can um, succeed in expanding that mission. And that's been great because we're working with Facebook and Google and, right. and Microsoft and Adobe, and we get a lot of good information and spin outs and resources from those connections. Um, if I were to highlight one, uh, a resource, um, we have a developer series. Um, that we've designed kind of the basic, most simple uh, things that technology companies are doing to make things accessible. We have that kind of outlined and we have a whole webinar series. So if you're kind of a, a tech designer developer and you want the 101 and how to, this isn't just theoretical, it's how to design and develop accessibly. We have a, a video series on there you can find on our website. Um, lastly, our employers. And we really focused a lot on employers because again, Pete is the partnership on employment and accessible technology. ODEP wants us to create a world in which people with disabilities can be hired and, and succeed in their jobs. And so we work with employers to impact um, their awareness and hopefully their uh, procurement and use of accessible technology. Um, if I were to highlight some, they already talked about TalentWorks, which is hiring. Uh, we also have uh, something called Buy IT, and it's really a step-by-step, -step, um, the procurement cycle. So any company that's going to buy technology kind of has a cycle, and we walk them through, okay, if you're going to buy technology, what are the questions you need to ask when and of who to make sure you're getting the technology accessible? And we go way past, uh, if anybody's familiar with the VPATs and the check boxes, that doesn't always make sure that you're getting what you need. So we have examples, we have scenarios to run, we have questions to ask, we have templates that you can use on your proposals. So our buy IT resource is really great um, for employers and those who are responsible for buying the technology. And the last one I'll plug is we just have one called staff training. We realize whether you're an HR or a manager or you're on the technology side or you're on the legal policy side, uh, if you're an employer, different people need to know different things about accessibility, right? There are many different parts to it. So we've created something called staff training that really lists, depending on where you are in the organization, what is it that you need to know about accessibility? Because everybody doesn't need to know everything. 
Right. Uh, we all just need to know a little bit and how it impacts what we do. And so we've put that resource up that can help people get the information they need, specific trainings out there. We've kind of got the best resources. Uh, so any employer could go there and, and really skill up and train their employees depending on where they are in the enterprise. Yeah, if you have not um, visited Pete Works, and we'll make sure you have all the <clears throat> all their information to check them out, but there is a ton of really good, good information out there. And they're always looking to expand and make it bigger. They are very good partners. I have found that they're always listening. They're always wanting to add more value. They really believe in partnerships. Their job is really to create foundation around everything we're doing. And, and they're not only here to help the U.S. Now, of course, they're U.S., but the, you know, if you can get to the URL, you can get to the information. And so yeah. they're they're very yeah. engaged in these big conversations, including global. We, we, are, we are focused on, you know, US because it's taxpayer dollars, but, yes. but ODEP has allowed us to, where it benefits, um, obviously, as you mentioned, anyone can get the resources, but we have had some partnerships. I mentioned web for all which is an international thing. As long as it comes back and benefits, you know, uh, US, US citizens and employers, then it, then it works. Um, we work with um, IAAP. Uh, yes. International Association for Accessibility Professionals. You know, they're going to do a worldwide global yes. uh, certification on what it means to be accessible. Uh, so we support their efforts as well because we know even though it's global, impacting there has an impact back home. Um, We're all together. We're all in this together. And, it, you know, we got to kind of everyone needs to move together. And that, that way, you know, we'll, we'll see movement here. So right. you know, we're, not, we're not limited. Uh, we definitely love the international aspect as long as it's having an impact uh, here here in our home. I agree. And I, I did want to say when you were talking about uh, hackathons, um, I'm going over uh, to Dublin in November to uh, be part of uh, the Hackathon Access Dublin. So mm -hmm. I, I and I know that we were talking uh, yesterday at at the upcoming, well, the future M enabling uh, conference, which will be next June, about a hackathon there. So the hackathons are very interesting, and we're learning a lot about them as societies. Yep. And you know, sometimes we hear about hackathons that some really great ideas happen, and then nothing comes of them. But you know, I think there's a lot of things we can do to make sure that that happens. And um, Go ahead. Go ahead. Josh. Well, I just that was the biggest. We wanted to do hackathons. We thought they were a neat, fun way to draw attention. And we heard the biggest gripe was nothing comes out of it. And right, so we, right. we have definitely worked hard to set up, um, you know, how they can pull and input the information and ideas. So we do a lot of follow up. If you've partnered with us around a hackathon, we're going to make sure you get the ideas. We're going to make sure you get the code. We're going to ask you, did you? Did you pull it? Have you implemented? Um, because we want it to have a real impact. Um, you know, we haven't all set it up yet, but I think uh, this year the Web for All conference is actually in in Silicon Valley in San Francisco. Oh wow, that's so amazing! We have a, I think, a big opportunity to have a major hackathon this year because we've done it. You know, other parts of the world and they've been smaller, but because of all those partnerships I mentioned, and because it's here, um, I'm really looking forward to potentially this spring having a a big hackathon and one that definitely has a real impact uh, on the other side and the output. Yeah, that's exciting. And we're going to do a show about the Dublin hackathon too. So Great. we'll make sure you get that information. Yeah, but th program. there's just some really cool things happening. So uh, I know that uh, I could probably talk to you for hours, but I, I, um, I know we're getting close to the end of the time and I want you to tell everybody how to find you. But before we do that, uh, I know that you do webinars every month. Will you just talk about a few more services? And once again, please, uh, audience members, take the time to go out and look at these resources. This is a wonderful resource and they're supporting the community, they're supporting the vendors, they're supporting the employers. Uh, it's just, uh, uh, once again, I'm very proud of SJ and I'm also very proud of Pete Works. ODEP is really making a difference. Um, and I, I just am uh, very appreciative of that as being such an active part of the community. But so tell us just a little bit more, because once again, the webinars, I yeah. always try to never miss. I yeah. was proud to do one, always yeah. available to do more. But tell us more about the webinars. Sure. So first of all, definitely it's uh, PeteWorks.org, P-E-A-T-W-O-R-K-S. 
www.ncpsf.org. And that's where all our resources are. Uh, and so and we, before you go that on social media, tell us where you're on social media. media. Yep, at Pete Works on Twitter. So at P-E-A-T-W-R-K-S. And same with Facebook. So we really function on Twitter and Facebook and recently did a Twitter chat with you. Thanks for having us. Yes, Access uh, Chat. And that video is live on www.axschat.com. Corinne did a, an amazing job. So please go and do that. And we'll provide that on the link so that you can get that as well. Awesome. Go I'll ahead, Josh. That as well so we can, we can uh, cross-link it. Uh, but yeah, we have a ton of webinars over the years. We did used to do them monthly. Uh, okay. We scaled back and this year we started doing podcasts. But Okay. We have, I don't know, 70, 80 plus uh, archived webinars that you could go find on our website uh, that, that have a full range of ideas and discussions that you could just search and pull them up. Uh, but we also started doing podcasts this year. And I think we have a good dozen or more uh, called The Future of Work. And we partnered with um, Workology that's really influential in the HR space because we want to try to get a little bit outside of our audience and preaching to the choir and so we did a we talked a lot about you know how employers use artificial intelligence or any of the new yes. cutting edge technologies i won't go into the details but the podcast future of work is another great one and then we put out blogs and articles every month and they are um, informative they're from our partners we're actually a very small team and so we depend on you know experts like yourself or the companies to come in and and source these ideas to share and so we're just trying to get out the best ideas and, and spark conversation. So uh, really on our website, you can find almost anything. And if you have any questions or want to reach out, um, info at peteworks.org. If you were to email info at peteworks.org, or you could email me directly. It's J Christensen. You can find it on the website, but J-C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N-S-O-N at peteworks.org. <laughs> uh, because we are always looking to partner um, and foster collaboration and see where we can provide lift to existing projects or create new ones. Yes, and we really appreciate what you're doing. We really, really appreciate it. We, unfortunately, you get so much negative news about the U.S. these days, and there's actually some really powerful, beautiful, amazing things happening in the United States, and Pete Works is one of them. So, oh, Josh, I'm thank you. I'm going to make one last plug. Absolutely. The exciting stuff we're doing um, are really around... Um, apprenticeships and so yes I think they might have talked about that during your access check so I'd encourage people but you know one area I think we can really move the needle on people with disabilities being employed in the technology sector which is the employment of the future are around apprenticeships and we have some new resources um, online there you'll see on our home page uh, but I think that's a really positive way for non-traditional folks to get involved in high paying real jobs um, you know uh, that could have an impact so I'm, I'm really excited and positive about that future and uh you know the the difference it could make in our in our country and, and i will uh, I, I totally agree with you about the apprenticeships i always i always wondered why we went away from apprenticeships because that's how we learn yeah. I, if i want to be an electrician yeah i can go to school but how i'm really going to learn is following somebody around and learning what on, they're doing well on the yeah. job real time. This, I, I never understood why we moved away from that as a country. I think apprenticeships, and, and we did the internships, but they very rarely led to employment. And yeah. But the apprenticeships make so much sense to me. I'm, I'm really glad that Pete Works is supporting us bringing apprenticeships back. I, I just think it's, that's how exactly. we learn the jobs. Yeah. yeah. The Department of Labor wants to expand them so they can be more flexible and and easier for individuals, easier for companies so that you can, they say, learn while you earn. And so yes. I think that is, and when you talk about positive and stuff the government's doing, I think supporting this is going to help employers um, and too. help employees. And it's, 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 it's a positive sign. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about that. And I, I just really am appreciative of the work, Josh, that you and the entire team is doing. You've got, like you said, it's a small team, but boy, it is a powerful, amazing team. And special thanks to ODEP and Department of Labor for funding these amazing programs. And um, I look forward to continue to, uh, you know, tell my audience about what you're doing. So Josh, thank you so much for being on this thank show. Thank you for having us and promoting our work. And I look forward to working with you more in the future. Yes. Thank you everyone for joining today. And Good luck to everybody in North Carolina and anybody else. I, the ferry that went down in Tanzania, uh, just
just sometimes all we get is the sad news. So Josh, thank you for being part of our good news today. And uh, special thanks again to Don for joining us and for my producer, Doug, for us to behind the scenes. And we will talk to you all next week. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend.